the last lecture, we discussed the philosophy and functions that organizational culture serves. In this one, we get practical and focus on the ways that we can see and interpret an organization's culture. So the first form of organizational culture are symbols. When we talked about organizational cultures being symbolic, we can be quite literal in this in terms of the types of symbols an organization uses to represent itself and, and to embody what the organization means. So the first type of symbols can be objects. These could be flags, they could be the logo, it could be what's displayed about the organization that carries meaning to it. What's important is that these objects themselves have to carry meaning to people within the organization or potentially outside, but we focus mostly internally. So make sure that when we identify an object that it has with it some kind of meaning, it helps to explain what the organization is about. You always want to frame that in terms of the characteristics or the outcomes of culture that we discussed in the first podcast. Settings are a second type of organizational symbol that can give us cues as to what the organization is, how it functions, and even how people within the organization relate to one another. So when we walk into a setting, we start to use the information that we see around us as a way of interpreting how we should behave and likely what are the relationships or the positions with, of the people in those spaces. So if we walk into a bank, for example, we see high counters and it gives us a feeling of we have to queue, we have to walk up, do our business and leave. It's not a place that's inviting. Whereas if you compare, say, a nightclub to a pub, it gives you different indicators as to how we're supposed to interact. But then if we think about an office and even how somebody's office is set up, if you take a look at this image, this probably isn't just an ordinary worker and the type of, of office that, that an ordinary worker might have. Most people, when they look at this image, get a sense that this is probably a decision maker. The size of the chair, the nature of the setting, it's kind of nice. Trust me, when we get into most offices, most of our individual offices, if we have them, aren't quite so nice. So there's something about the polish, about the quality, that would suggest that this person has power. So even the way that we think of and look at settings will influence our expectations for our behaviors and the people within those settings. People can also be symbolic of an organization. These might be real people, they might be caricatures of people, but if we think about the performers within an organization, they can really set the tone and symbolize what the organization means. So for example, KFC is based on an actual person, but over time he's become a bit of a caricature as to what he represents in terms of, of a very American Southern view of, of what the KFC franchise is all about. In a more meaningful way though, Steve Jobs symbolized what Apple was. And actually since his passing, it's one of the struggles that Apple has had in terms of what Apple as a company represents because he was so tied up in the meaning behind the organization. Or you compare that to someone like Tony Hayward for BP who became very controversial as the BP crisis. They become the the symbol of what's gone wrong in an organization. So no matter if someone is over time ends up being more of a character, if they have influenced and guided the organization, or even if they become a symbol of negativity in the organization, people and influential actors in themselves can be very symbolic of what an organization is and what its culture represents. Moving on from symbols, the second form of organizational culture that Trison Bayer identified is language. That if we pay attention to the type of language that is used within an organization, we can understand its values and its ideology. So for example, one of the types of language that we should pay attention to is the jargon or the slang used within an organization. So modern businesses, you will hear ROI all the time. The return on investment is a really important indicator in how front and center 
that is in terms of an organization or even a department's function and its mission will tell you a little bit about what's important to the organization. If everything has to have a pound for pound return on any resources invested into it, the way that you build arguments for resourcing, for staffing, will be very different than an organization that uses language focused on social mission or its overall objectives. So even those kinds of differences about how the organization functions. And certainly within professions and within groups, you'll see different colloquial language being used. So if you see a lot of colloquial language, it can suggest a more relaxed setting. The more formal the language use or less slang that's used, it's probably a, um, a more formal kind of setting. And so it would be inappropriate to interact in a fairly colloquial kind of way. So either the particular jargon that's used or the slang that's used can give you a lot of indications and clues about what the organization is really like. A second element of language that's used and developed within professions and within organizations are the gestures, signs, and signals that might be used. You know, if we think about um, even the colloquial use of yellow card, most people, even Americans, understand what a yellow card is as the kind of warning. So when we think about how different kinds of visual symbols, gestures, the single signals and the signs get used within an organization and what they mean. So in a very electronic kind of way, is someone available for a meeting or not? If you look on Microsoft Teams, you can see whether there's a green light beside them or a red light. I hear colleagues get very frustrated with people who will send meeting requests live while they're actually in a meeting and they say, but I put my meeting symbol up. So how we relate to one another, how we use the visual cues available to us will affect not only how we relate and how we interact, but also what are the common norms within an organization? How do we visually represent ourselves, our work, our status in that organization? So gestures, signals, and signs give us a clue about interpersonal reactions and interactions, but also then collectively about what that means for the organization. Songs are a third type of language that can be used to convey a lot of cultural meaning. I mean, let's let's step back and say that if your organization has a song, that's probably going to be an important indicator about something about that organization. Now, a lot of, of work organizations don't necessarily have songs, but a lot of our social organizations may. So if you think about the meaning, the history, the, the, even the attitudes about the organization that can be communicated with songs where they exist can tell you a lot about how people try to build identification with one another within an organizational culture. So having one to begin with, let alone if everyone knows it, is a critical component. So in the United States, our colleges and universities all have fight songs. Whether you know it or not, probably says more about how big of an American football fan that you are, because for the most part, they're sung at American football games. So the degree to which you have school spirit would probably tell you that you, you know this school fight song. But this can be indicative of a way of showing identity, membership, and connection with one another. A fourth type of language that we're probably all more familiar with in organizational settings is humor, gossip, and rumor. Now, the degree to which all of these are appropriate or inappropriate in the ways that they carry on in organizational settings will tell you a lot about the organization and about the, the power structures within it. If you ever really want to know who's powerful and who's not, pay attention to the gossip and to the rumors. And this is for a very simple reason, is that this is what people hear at the, the proverbial cooler, but in the background, through IMs, through who goes and visits each other when we're actually in offices, whatever the case may be. Humor is also one of those things that is 
is changing over time and that people are, are often more guarded about. So if, if you're part of, of the humor, if there's a joking, jovial culture within an organization that lets you know that you're an in-group member. However, even the use of humor in and of itself can be controversial because what's funny may not be funny to everyone, and especially if it's humor that picks on particular groups or particular types of groups. So all of this becomes telling about what an organization's about. And, and actually, one of the best ways for a newcomer to an organization to really understand it is to, to listen. Listen to who people talk about, how people talk about them, and what kinds of, of really stories come out about that that are that are all about the ways that we use gossip rumor and humor strategically within organizations a fifth type of language that can let us learn about an organizational culture is to look at the metaphors that get used for the organization now these are representations of of the metaphors that get used in promotion about an organization, but within organizations, what kinds of metaphors, what kinds of visual appeals, how do we really see our organization? If we're explaining it, one of the powers that metaphors carry is that they offer a shorthand to what it means to be in an organization. So how do people refer to the organization? How do people refer to each other, to the boss, what kinds of imagery gets used when you're talking about it, that's the kind of power that a metaphor gives. So if you talk about an organization as being really a meat grinder, that all that matters is what comes out and sometimes what goes in is unidentifiable, that's gonna give you a pretty clear picture of how someone views the organization. So pay attention to those kinds of metaphors. They end up being a pretty good indicator of what people feel about and how the emotionally charged environment functions within an organization. The final type of language is a form of organizational culture that I want to talk about are slogans or proverbs. Now, of course, these can be behind closed doors and not really heard by anyone else, but they can also be the organization's official slogan or proverb. For example, with Google, the don't be evil, this is something that they try to use to represent their organization. So externally, one of the reasons that Google offers things like free analytics certifications, connections for websites, they publish all the ways that they do SEO is a way of trying to be transparent. Of course, you can pay f any organization can pay for Google ads and that moves you up the list. But over time, what the organization has tried to do is try to reduce the cheating in terms of where pages appear in terms of a Google search, because for them, the value comes in the open exchange free, the open and free exchange of information. But this also for the organization comes within the organization as well. Now it's tough to be hired by Google. They are looking for a particular type of employee, but once you're there, Google makes for a very positive kind of environment. For example, they feed you well. There's um, open kitchen with breakfast, lunch, snacks, pretty much any kind of energy drink that you want, sodas, juices, water, whatever it might be. They also do quite fancy lunches once a week and they put on different events for their employees. They're geared towards younger employees more than pretty much anything else. And so they do environments where they, that employees can get to know one another, that they can feel connected. They also do weekly whole organization chats where the head guys, depends on the week which one appears, but where they come online and that people from everywhere can ask them questions and that they try to engage. So as a slogan or a proverb, the company tries to implement that at a very genuine level. When we're looking at the forms of organizational culture, we can look at internally and externally how the organization tries to represent itself, as well as how the employees represent the organization. The third form of organizational culture that Trice and Bayer discuss are the narratives. 
These are the stories that are told about the organization, both formally and informally within the organization. And there are three different types of narratives that I'll talk about. The first are the stories in the legends. Now, again, you will hear informal stories and legends that, and one of the most interesting ways to understand what an organization is about is to speak to its members and to have them to open with a very simple question. Tell me a story about what it means to be here. When researchers do this, they find that across a whole organization's group of employees, there will be two or three stories that the majority of the employees will tell about what it means to work in the organization. And so you can really learn a lot about the organization from that. For our example, we'll talk about how organizations, in this case, the stories and legends that organizations tell about themselves. So one of the critical types of stories that is told is about how the organization was founded. If you look at almost every different organization's website, they'll give you some usually kind of short version of this creation story. And then they'll talk about what it means to them as how they've put together their organization. So Fat Tire, I think, is quite a nice microbrew that comes from the U.S. It also happens to come from Fort Collins, Colorado, which is where I did my undergraduate. That's why I'm familiar with it. But they tell this lovely story about the founder, his vision, and what it means in terms of, of how they approach the ethic of their organization. They're trying to give people who see the story, an insight into what they think that the organization means. So whether it's conscious like this or unconscious with the stories that employees might tell, stories and legends are vital to an organization's identification and experience. The second type of narrative that Trice and Bayer discuss are sagas. Sagas are different from ordinary stories or legends because what they focus on is how an organization can overcome adversity. That there was a major crisis and they show how the organization can change for the better. So in around 2002 or 2003, I was part of a consultancy team that was helping Applied Materials or the, the Shared Services Division, which is their accountancy division, roll out a major organizational change. They were introducing a piece of software in order for the organization to be compliant with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Now, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act came about in the US because of um, a major accounting scandal within a few organizations, but most notably one in Texas called Enron. Ultimately, the accounting corruption was so bad in Enron that not only did a multi-million dollar company fail, but the people who were in charge of the company, at least one of them committed suicide. Several people went to jail. So when we're talking about monumental kinds of cases that lead to major statutory change across the United States, this scandal was one of those. But even so, that wasn't the saga itself, because what Applied Materials realized is they had to personalize it. So a few years before this rollout, um, they had actually had their own case of corruption within Applied Materials. There had been a woman who is pretty much in charge of all of the final accounts in the accountancy division. And what she had done over the course of 20 years was skim just little bits of money, nothing that would be noteworthy, nothing that would you know, pop up any red flags. It may be cents or a few dollars, but she would do this kind of skimming in over 20, 30 years that she was employed by the organization, had accumulated hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in embezzled funds. So for Applied Materials, this had been, of course, a big deal. And one of the, the changes that the organization hold, had already made was ensuring that there wasn't just one set of eyes on the books, that they built in redundancy. So as they were rolling out this major new piece of software, something that everyone would have to learn, and that this piece of software was being rolled out globally, Applied Materials has offices and major functions in 10 to 12 countries at least. 
All of them were pulled into Austin, Texas for this rollout of the software. They had the, the software company there. We had organized the rest of the event and were putting to it together. But this was the story told, the story of, yes, we know that it's a legislative requirement, but this is why this matters to us. In telling this saga, it was a way to help justify and explain that not only ha can this happen to any organization in terms of corruption and a lack of transparency, but it had already happened to applied materials. So it was designed to help buy-in. It was an authentic story. But this is how sagas are used in organizations. They often accompany organizational changes or they're used to explain why major changes had to happen. No doubt after 2020, there are going to be a lot of organizational sagas that emerge. But that's really what the function of these kinds of stories are. And they're really important in terms of how organizations manage and deal with change as it emerges. The final type of narrative that Trice and Bayer discuss are myths. Now, whereas a story and a legend might be about the, how the organization is founded and the fun of it, but also about trying to convey meaning, and a saga is about trying to convey how an organization has overcome something, a myth is about creating open stories that have a lot of different interpretations, that myths emerge as a way to try and create mystique around an organization. Now, myths typically aren't official. They aren't the official telling of an organization's story. Myths typically are told about the organization, either by its members or people outside the organization. So what's interesting about myths is that there is an infallibility of them because they're general and they let people draw their own conclusions about what really happened. They can be instructive and tell people about the organization in ways that are unofficial. So if you're trying to explain what it really means to work in an organization, instead of talking about the way the organization was founded or, or a story about how it overcome, overcame some kind of challenge, you might tell some story about something that happened in the organization. It may be true, it may not. But the meaning of the story and how that's decoded by the people who hear it, that's what ends up being important. So if you take, for example, something like Facebook the movie, that's telling a myth. It's not necessarily what happened. You take it with a grain of salt, but it certainly communicates a set of points about what it is that Facebook is. Now, whether you take that as being good, bad, or indifferent, that's up to you. But that's what the purpose of the myth is. It's, it's meant for you to interpret and, and the telling of it will give some cue as to how we should interpret it, but they're left quite fuzzy. And that's what's interesting about the myth is that it's all about guiding people to what the organization really is about. The fourth and final form of organizational culture that Trice and Bayer discuss are practices. And they discuss it in a couple of different ways. So when we're talking about practices, we're talking about what are the routine things that happen in an organization? What are people supposed to do or not do within that organizational context? And how are they ritualized and formalized? So the first type that I'll talk about are rituals and taboos. So for example, if you were in traditional Japanese organizations, especially during the 1980s and 1990s, you might go to work every morning and do calisthenics. Now, coming from a US and a British tradition, that might be very strange that you walk out every day as you start work and do a bit of a stretch. But they had their own research and their own approach that said that this actually energized their employees. And so it was a form of bringing together and it was just something that they did each and every time that they would start their day. When I was coaching debate, one of the things that we did in the morning were morning vocal warm ups with crazy little limericks and rhymes to help get our mouths operating. But mostly it was a way of doing a bit of team building before we went to the tournament each day. So the rituals, what is it that happens in the organization? 
It might be that everyone goes to the coffee room and grabs a cup of coffee or they go to the cafeteria. So it leads back at one of the things that we do is we have a coffee break quite a lot. So if we want to have a chat about something that's going on, we'll go down to the cafe in normal times and grab a cup of coffee, sit for 20 minutes, have a bit of a gossip and then head off. That's how a lot of the business gets conducted. At the same time, what is it that we shouldn't do in an organization? What are the taboos about how we behave and how we engage with one another? Asking for examples of these and trying to figure out what's right and wrong in any kind of a situation is pretty interesting. So taboos in organizational culture will come up. Oftentimes, we're not told about them until we violate them, but sometimes we get a clue about what we do in should and shouldn't do. But no matter whether we're talking about what's normal or abnormal, paying attention to the practices that are enshrined and routinized within an organization will tell us about that organization and how it views the relationships between one another and how we do business on a regular basis. The other major category of practices that Trice and Bayer discuss are rites and ceremonies. Most organizations have some kind of commemoration for major events and major transitions for organizations and for people within them. So for example, if someone gets a promotion, what happens? In an organization, do people celebrate the birthdays? You know, the, the purpose of ceremonies, why do we have graduation ceremonies? All of these commemorate important events within an organizational setting. And so the degree to which there are different rites and ceremonies will tell you what's actually important within the organization. So if your organization really focuses on uh, rites of promotion, rites of celebration, do they have commemoration for those who are no longer there? What is it that people come together as a group and they recognize and they memorialize? This will give you a pretty good indication about what the organization is about and how they view those kinds of ceremonies. You know, in a lot of organizations, someone's birthday cake, you know, you do a little bit of a happy birthday and others, not so much. Why is it that people want to celebrate with each other? Is it just to have a bit of a lunch break where we all get a sugar high? Or is it about sharing and suggesting that we genuinely care about our colleagues? Maybe a little bit of both. But so how we decode and how we interpret those will give us another indication about what the organization's culture and values are all about. We already talked about these kinds of rituals, rites, and ceremonies when we talked about Southwest Airlines and their Friday barbecues. They also have a lot of the types of um, the experiences like when the bosses that come in and take on other people's um, jobs for a day. All of these types of rituals, rites, ceremonies, and taboos give us the sense of what the organization's about. So when we pull back out and we think about the four different forms of organizational culture that I've discussed, you start to get a very measurable way to interpret and understand what an organization's about. It helps to, to take those values that people can talk about and put them into daily life. So when we're evaluating and assessing an organization, we can get a sense of whether the organization is true to the, what it says it's about, or from an employee perspective, if there are potential warning signs. These are something, and we'll talk about this in live sessions, these are things that we can explore in terms of pitfalls to look for when you're interviewing, when you're first in jobs, and how do we know what it means to be within an organization.